Welcome to My Vaccine is Jesus. Today's discussion is in the False Prophets playlist and is entitled Episode Number Two, Addendum Number One. Let us begin the discussion. Here's a comment I got on the original video from a Keeping Watch 95. Progressive Christianity started with Paul. Progressive, which also means enlightened, modern, radical, tolerant, broad, wide, etc. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 21. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 21. You all can't get much more tolerant and radical than to become without law. So... Keeping Watch 95 interprets that to mean that Paul was without law. Hmm, interesting. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, You just can't become any more broad and wide than claiming all things are lawful to me. So he thinks that these verses teach that St. Paul was without law, and all things were lawful to him. All things. Let's look at this in context. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 to 23. For though I be free from all men, so is no slave to any man, yet I have made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. So he was a free man, but he became the slave or the servant to all to gain them for Christ, right? And unto the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. So what does that mean? When he'd be preaching the gospel to the Jews, he would follow the customs of the Jews. So they would be more comfortable, and they would listen to him and see and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And spread the gospel message. Verse 21, to them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. So again, when he'd be around Gentiles, he would not follow these customs. That's what the law means. What does that mean? You think he did murder? He did adultery? How wicked to think so. No, he would just, when he was with the Gentiles, he would not act like a Jew in terms of, you know, not breaking bread with them, for example. This is what this means. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Okay? And again, even in verse 21, notice, to them that are without law as without law, but notice then he has a caveat, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. So he himself saying, no, 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 I was not without law to God, and I was under the law to Christ. So how our friend there to the left is interpreting this is wrong and actually wicked. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 through 33. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Continuing, let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no questions for conscience sake. Again, you're not going to follow certain customs and saying, well, I'm not going to eat that shellfish, right? Why? Because you're going to turn people off. They're not going to listen to the gospel message. That's what he's talking about. Not adultery and fornication and wicked things, just Jewish custom. But if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So notice, do not eat food sacrificed unto idols. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? So the idea is, let's say they give you food and don't tell you where it came from. You can eat it. Now, if they tell you, oh, by the way, this food was sacrificed to an idol, you can't do that. You see the difference. For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? 
Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jew nor to the Gentiles, because you'd be giving them offense, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be safe. So notice, he's pleasing men not so that they'll give him things and do nice things for him. He's pleasing men so that what? They'll listen to him and be saved. That's the whole purpose. And all things are these customs, right? Those concepts of the law, not things that are obviously everyone knows in their heart, including Gentiles that are wrong, right? Wicked things, fornication, adultery, murder, slander, lying, stealing, etc. To think that, no, he did those things is beyond wicked yet again. Continuing in his uh, comment on the left, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 10. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 11. And though thy knowledge, through, excuse me, thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. 1 Corinthians 8, 9 to 10. You can't be more enlightened than the weaker brother than to have a a liberty to sit at meat in the idol's temple and eat those things which are offered to idols. <laughs> That's not what that says. Just don't do it in front of a weaker, unenlightened brother who might take offense. Paul taught progressive Christianity. Again, we already proved from what we just see there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you're not supposed to do that at all. You're not supposed to eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, if you're there with these Gentiles, and you're in this temple preaching the gospel to them, trying to save them, to have them see and believe upon Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and their God, and to understand the importance of his death, his burial, and his resurrection, then if they give you food, eat it. Don't offend them. But if they give you food and say, oh, by the way, this was sacrificed to an idol, you have to refuse at that point. So let's look in context. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 to 13. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. The, the liberty is what? The, the Jewish customs of, you know, eating shrimp or whatever, that's that liberty. For if any man see thee which has knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And th through the no thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world stand it, lest I make my brother to offend. So the idea is not that, oh, I can eat meat sacrificed uh, to idols, but not my brother. No, 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 no one is supposed to eat meat sacrificed to idols. The problem is, if your brother, who really doesn't understand this stuff as well as you, sees you at meat in the idol's temple, not eating meat sacrificed to idols, but he won't understand. And he might say, oh, I guess it's okay to eat meat sacrificed unto idols. It's not okay. So this individual does not interpret this correctly at all. And again, it comes off wicked. My response, really? So St. Paul taught something distinct from Lord Jesus and the rest of the apostles? Are you a supporter of the teachings of Reverend Brandon Robertson about being unsure whether or not God even exists? About Lord Jesus being a racist who was shamed by a Gentile woman? About marriage not being solely between one man and one woman? About fornication and sodomy being holy? By the way, that's not slander. I've seen things where he basically states all of those as beliefs. Forgive me, I'm not going to go into that right now. Lord willing, I will in the future. Your interpretation of those verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 to chapter 10 are quite silly, by the way, which I just went over with you. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 to 9, in regards to St. Paul teaching something distinct from Lord Jesus and the apostles, like this different progressive uh, gospel. I marvel 
that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. See, these other gospels, these progressive gospels, are perversions of the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that we, which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As you have said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So any teaching against the gospel of Lord Jesus, against the gospel that the apostles and St. Paul taught, which was the exact same gospel, that is accursed. It's a curse upon you. Hmm, progressive Christianity, a curse upon you, maybe. His response, I am a supporter and believer in the one teacher, Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 23, verses 8 through 10. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. Now this is the King James rendering. And in the Greek, master in verse 8 is didaskalos, didaskalo. Greek Strong's ring 1320. An instructor, a teacher, master. So teacher. In verse 10, master is master. Notice it's not didaskalos. It's not the same Greek word. It's kathihite, kathihitis. That's Greek Strong's word 2519, kathihitis. A teacher, a leader, teacher, guide, master. So I do typically prefer the King James rendering. But right here, I don't think this is the best rendering because it would make you think it's the same words. So if I were doing the translation, and obviously I'm not, I would have in verse 8, teacher. And I would have in verse 10, leaders and leader. Not the same word. So I wouldn't have teacher, teachers, teacher. I surely wouldn't have master, masters, master. I would have a different word, teacher, and then leaders, leader. Now that, notice, kathihite, teachers or leaders, Kathikitis, teacher or leader, that's only used this one single time. So that particular Greek Strong's word, you know, uh, 2519, and these two different variations, the plural and the singular, are only used here. So that's interesting because that's only applied to Lord Jesus, whereas the daskalos is used 15 times, many of them for Lord Jesus, but others that aren't Lord Jesus, including... St. Paul, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ, and lie not a teacher, didaskalos, of the Gentiles in faith and verity. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher, didaskalos, of the Gentiles. Acts chapter 15, 20. So let's look at some of these teachings but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. These are the teachings at the Apostles' Council. Basically, they made a decision in regards to Gentile converts that they would not have to follow the, um, you know, the Jewish customs of, of uh, uh, you know, getting circumcised and following the Sabbath. Obviously, Oh, yeah, they could, they could do anything they wanted to. They're without law. Of course not. Specifically, notice what they had to abstain from. Pollution of idols, fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. That's again in the Apostles' Council. Reiterated in verse 29 of chapter 15, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. Notice our friend there interpreted that that um, it was okay to eat meat offered to idols. No, that was a that was a strict order. So what? Saint Paul didn't follow the strict order he gave to other people. Wicked. So basically, he was a hypocrite. Wicked, wicked, wicked. And again, if you read it, that's not what it says at all. Acts chapter twenty one verse twenty five. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing save only in terms of you know, Jewish customs. 
right? They don't have to get circumcised. They don't have to follow the Sabbath. They don't have to, you know, refrain from eating shellfish or whatever. Save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. By the way, it's fornication. Any sexual activity outside of one married man adult with one married woman adult, one husband with one wife, right? And by the way, Reverend Brandon Robertson teaches explicitly against that, right? Oh, that's progressive Christianity. That's accursed. That's what that is. And again, Lord Jesus in the gospel gave them this authority. Look, Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, New King James Version here. And I will give you, St. Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So there's decisions you make in the church, Peter. When you make them, I'm going to follow you up. If you bind something saying it's unlawful, you can't do it, I'm going to say it's unlawful. And if you loosen saying something that you can do it, I'm going to loosen it as well in heaven. And again, to think, oh, St. Peter would have done wicked things. Really? Wow. Again, wicked, 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 including calling God wicked and calling Lord Jesus wicked to pick people as your apostles to spread your gospel that would ever think of doing that. Again, they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. It would have been impossible for them to make decisions which were wicked. Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, New King James Version again. Assuredly, I say to you, now we speak to all the disciples, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Basically, a reiterate, reiteration of what he said to St. Peter in Matthew 16, 19. And then, after he breathes the Holy Spirit on them, in John chapter 20, verse 23, whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted, not will be. It's going to happen right now. They're given the power. So basically, he's promising this, them this power in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18, and they now have the power in John 20. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Well, we saw what they bound and loosened, right? What did they loosen? They didn't have to follow the Jewish customs, the Gentile believers. What did they bound? You can't do fornication. You can't eat things sacrificed to idols, for example. And does Lord God, Lord Jesus follow up like he promised? Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 to 16. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was a faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctor of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So notice, what did they decide in the Apostles' Council? Well, no fornication, no eating things sacrificed unto idols. Huh. So here's this Gentile church in Pergamos, and what's he saying? That they, you better repent, all of you eating things sacrificed to idols and committing fornication, right? And then earlier, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, and then verse 6, unto the angel of the church in Ephesus, again, a Gentile church in Asia Minor, right? These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, verse 6, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. They were kind of a blend between, you know, the, the gospel and kind of pagan practices, like what? Fornication, eating sacrificed uh, things to idols, etc. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18 to 24. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works. And the last, your works, to be more than the first, notwithstanding of a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, who calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to do what? To commit fornication and to eat things, eat things sacrificed unto idols. Hmm, pretty important. Oh, so St. Paul did it, wicked and foolish. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So notice, when people who, what, are members of the church, and they're doing things that Lord God doesn't want, like what? 
committing fornication, eating things sacrificed to idols, the first thing Lord God, Lord Jesus will do, will give you time to repent. And let's say you don't. Then what's going to happen, he's going to cast you into a bed, a sick bed, and into great tribulation. All kinds of problems are going to happen in your life. Except they repent of their deeds. You need to repent. And what happens if you don't? And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. So notice, if, you, if you're a believer, if you're in the church, and you're doing wicked things like what? Fornication, eating things sacrificed unto idols, God will allow you to repent. If you don't repent, you're going to be in a sick bed. You're going to have trouble in your life. And if you still don't repent, you're going to die physically. Well, maybe not spiritually, but physically you will. But, you know, before your time. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, in which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. So notice, oh, don't worry about the Sabbath. Don't worry about eating shellfish. Don't worry about uh, circumcision. Exactly what was decided in the Apostles' Council. And by the way, St. Paul was there. If that is indeed true, that he follows, uh, you know, Lord Jesus as his teacher. What is your problem with my video? That I share verses that show that God doesn't change, that Lord Jesus doesn't change, that we should love him and his commandments, including those pertaining to sexual morality. Interesting, you bring up 1 Corinthians chapter 8 to chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11, teaches that the sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13 to 20, preaches against all forms of fornication, surely including sodomy. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2 to 16, declares that marriage is between one man and one woman. By the way, is Lord Jesus your Lord and your God, as St. Thomas saw and believed in John chapter 20, verse 28, and I never heard back from him. Let's go through this. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus Christ is perfect, right? Progressive, wicked. John chapter 14, verse 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments, including what? Don't eat meat sacrificed to idols and don't do fornication. Leviticus chapter 22, verse 31. Therefore shall ye keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord because Lord Jesus is the Lord. John Chapter 20, verse 28, St. Thomas declared it, and Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord, O Kyriosmu, the Lord of me, and my God, Keo Theosmu, and the God of me. That's what you need to see and believe. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, men who are effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. This would be arsenokoite, which would be basically men who lie with mankind, what we would call what, a homosexual man, right? Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. What does that suggest? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 to 17. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. Notice he repeats it. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication. What's fornication again? any sexual activity at all, including sodomy, that's not one married man with who's a man, husband, with his one married wife, who's a woman, his wife, right? Uh, uh, but the body, uh, now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord, and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. So what is that? If you join, if you have sex with a harlot, with a prostitute, what? that's wicked. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Continuing verses 18 to 20. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Oh, this is so progressive. Really? Do you agree with this? Do you agree with this progressive Christianity? Which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication, right? 
Let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. One man, a dot with his wife. One woman, a dot with her husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye, not one the other, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that saint tempt you not for your incontinency. So notice... It's important, husband and wife, to have a sexual relationship. What's even more important is for them to have a spiritual relationship with God. So notice, they should have sexual relations together, but fasting and prayer are more important. But I speak this by permission and not of commandment. For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. He had a gift that he had no interest in such things. Verses 8 through 11. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them that if they abide, even as I, but if they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn, because you'll burn because of fornication. So if you have that desire, which most of us do, get married. One man, husband, with one wife, woman, adults. And unto the married I command, yea, not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. See, we don't agree with divorce. God doesn't like this. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. Verses 12 to 16. But to the rest, I, speak I, not the Lord, if, this is, so his belief, if any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. So if you're a believer and you're married to an unbeliever, leave her be. Don't, don't divorce her. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. Interesting. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. So if you're with an unbelieving spouse and they want to leave, let him leave. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God hath called us to peace. Again, this is not the Lord speaking. Paul says, this is me. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? So, there's my response to these comments. And again, the idea of progressing Christianity is a joke. It is wicked. It's another gospel. It is false. The verses this individual brings up, he doesn't understand them. They do not teach what he thinks, and yet again, look into Reverend Brandon Robertson. He is teacher of progressive Christianity, uh, and, and, and Lord willing, I will show many other of his teachings are beyond wicked, satanic, foolish, prideful, arrogant, etc. I pray that was edifying. Amen.